we go. All right. Welcome, everybody. Another week. So this week, we have uh, Chuck Rhodes and Marin Chambers. Uh, Chuck Rhodes has been a watershed researcher with the U.S. Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station in Fort Collins, Colorado, since 2003. He studies biogeochemical processes that regulate the delivery of clean water and that sustain productive soils and forests. His current research involves soil and water responses to wildfire, prescribed fire, fuel reduction treatments, and post-fire rehabilitation activities. The past decade, much of his research has been addressed in the watershed effects of severe water wildfires, extensive bark beetle outbreaks, and associated forest management activities. And then we'll have Marion Chambers. Uh, Marion is a research associate uh, for, uh, with the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute, CFRI, at Colorado State University. She's done botany and forest research in the Southern Rockies in montane, subalpine, and alpine ecosystems. Her primary interests include, are disturbance and restoration ecology, specifically forest recovery, resilience, and adaption in relationship to forest management, natural disturbances such as wildfire or insects slash disease outbreaks, and climate change. Marin's recent research examines forest regeneration and resilience in post fire landscapes in the Southern Rockies region. Additionally, in her role at CFRI, Marin serves as a bridge between science and management, working with forest collaborative groups across the country. Great. Thank you so much. And y'all, please take it away. I'll have Marin go first. Okay, so I'm going to go first. Let me make sure I've got my screen shared appropriately. All right. And can you all see my main title screen? Yeah, but we're back to just viewing the PowerPoint view and not the actual present. There it is. There it is. Yep. That looks great. Awesome. Well, um, thank you, Ty, for the introduction. And um, thank you to Nate, Cindy, and Gloria for the invitation to talk about um, long-term outlooks around post-fire recovery and resilience in the 2020 wildfires. This is something that I'm really interested in and passionate about. Um, so I'm just going to dive in. Um, so today, we're going to be talking, both Chuck and I are kind of splitting up this, um, this particular webinar. webinar. So I'm gonna be talking primarily about my role um, at CFRI, um, the forest types that burned in the 2020 Colorado wildfires, um, what we know about forest resilience in forest types that burn like this and particularly surrounding compound disturbances. And then some of the manager's concerns, um, the, the folks that I particularly work with and I see some of them on their call. So if I you know, speak for you, um, please correct me if, if I'm misrepresenting something. And then I just wanna leave you all with a couple of takeaways and next steps before I really let Chuck take it away and talk about his super cool um, study that's been examining serotony since the um, 2020 wildfire season last fall. So, um, so I work for the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute um, in the Forest and Rangeland Stewardship Department at Colorado State University. We were established by Congress through the Southwest Forest um, uh, Health and Wildfire Prevention Act of 2004 to serve as a bridge between science um, or researchers, managers, and stakeholders working to restore and enhance the resilience of forested ecosystems to wildfires in Colorado, the Southern Rocky Mountains, and the Intermountain West. And, really the, we kind of work at this intersection of science collaboration and what we like to refer to as actionable knowledge, which is really localized information that helps to impact on the ground decision-making. Um, and in, in my particular passion restores the resilience of forested ecosystems and in particular the, the ecosystem services that they provide. So, um, a lot of the work that I do is, you know, getting to talk with researchers, managers, and other stakeholders, doing science translation, um, doing research and monitoring. Um, and I get to talk with really amazing people like some of the folks that are, um, you know, highlighted in some of these, these photos. Um, and one of the highlights of my jobs is getting to go to on field trips um, to talk with managers, researchers, and stakeholders in the field. And, 
and really kind of um, develop ideas around what our, our needs are, what our knowledge gaps are. So um, a lot of the work that I've been doing in the last couple of years is really focusing on um, forest restoration, forest resilience, and then also post-fire environments. And this started really with my master's research um, where I looked at um, post-fire recovery in ponderosa pine dominated forests um, in the front range of Colorado. And so I, I bring this up to say that, you know, I've been interested in post-fire recovery for, you know, uh, several years now. And um, I just want to put up a, a map of the Cameron Peak Fire and some of the vegetation types that have been impacted. And so in the past 30 or so years, we've had a lot of very large fires. Um, for example, the 2002 Hayman Fire that burned um, in these lower elevation montane ecosystems in ponderosa pine dominated um, forests. And we've learned a lot about you know, how those forests are respond responding post fire. But in the last couple of years, and in particular in 2020, we had a lot of fires that burned at higher elevations um, in, in these kind of lodgepole pine and um, subalpine forests, which are a little bit um, more mesic. And so Laura Marshall last week um, did a fantastic job talking about the conifer um, or, or ponderosa pine um, fire and forest ecology and post-fire management. So today I'm not gonna talk about too much of that, but I am gonna focus in on the research and management concerns relating to these higher elevation forests that burned in the Cameron Peak and East Troublesome fires. So you can see from this map of the kind of pure forest types that burned in the Cameron Peak fire that a large majority of that fire burned in lodgepole pine and in subalpine fir forests. And, and this is true as well of the East Troublesome fire, which primarily burned in lodgepole pine, subalpine fir, and then aspen. Um, and so, you know, many of you are aware of this, but each forest type in Colorado has a very different fire ecology. And so this is an image from a document that my collaborators at CFRI and then also Gloria Edwards from the Southern Rockies Fire Science Network and I created last fall. Um, and I think Gloria might post that in the chat box if you want um, to take a look at the full document. But essentially what I wanna do is kind of focus in on some of these different fire ecologies to give a little bit of context to the, for this. So as I've mentioned, we've learned a lot from the fires that have occurred all over the West in Ponderosa pine dominated ecosystems for the last maybe 30 or so years. And the general story is that these forests have grown more dense and more homogenous, infilling with fire intolerant species such as Douglas fir, um, and that we're having larger and more severe fires than we knew to have occurred in the past. And again, Laura Marshall did a fantastic job of outlining this. Um, I definitely recommend checking out that talk for more details if you didn't see it. But what we're seeing is that we're having larger and more severe fires than we knew to have occurred in the past. Um, and, and they're resulting in these very large high severity burn areas, such as this um, particular burn area that is um, illustrated in this photo from the 2002 Hayman fire. And there is a, an incredible growing body of, of research that illustrates that we're seeing low tree regeneration in high severity burn areas here in Colorado and across the West. And, and this is due in, you know, in part to a couple of different things. The first is that um, the distance from surviving trees is really inhibiting tree regeneration in the middle of these large high severity burn patches. And this is a large part of what my master's research really focused on. I think this is coming from the fact that ponderosa pine seed is pretty heavy and large and doesn't do um, a lot of long distance dispersal. Um, and then another thing that we're, you know, kind of generally coming to in the, in the scientific um, literature is that climatic or moisture stress is really contributing to a lack of regeneration in many of the ponderosa pine dominated forests across the West and in particular here in Colorado. Um, but in our higher elevation forests where many of the 2020 um, wildfires primarily burned, they have very different fire ecologies. So I'm gonna briefly talk about that. Um, and more importantly, what we know and what we don't know about forest recovery in these higher elevation forests. So we know that with lodgepole pine, which was a forest type that was strongly impacted by the 2020 Colorado wildfire season and multiple wildfires, um, that lodgepole has serotonous cones, which under kind of standard or normal conditions will open readily following wildfire and then spread seed rapidly to regenerate um, a, a fire area with these kind of perfect conditions um, on the forest floor. And if anyone has ever walked through a regenerating 
lodgepole pine forest under kind of normal conditions, it is like walking through kind of a carpet um, or a blanket of, of baby lodgepole pine trees. However, the Cameron Peak fire um, had experienced the mountain pine beetle epidemic where, and this map is illustrating where the darker gray areas um, are mountain pine beetle mortality within the Cameron Peak um, fire perimeter. And the same is true for the East Troublesome and other 2020 Colorado wildfires, such as the Williams Fork and the Mullen fires, which burned in lodgepole pine forests that had experienced this beetle epidemic. And so many of the trees that were burned had burned trees that had been dead for many years. And so what we don't have a lot of good scientific information on is whether or not the cones in these dead trees that were impacted by mountain pine beetle have the same kind of serotony um, and thus, you know, potential forest recovery that we would expect to occur. And so this is really the essence of Chuck's talk. Um, and so I won't detail this too much. I'm sure he's gonna be discussing this in a lot more detail and a much higher level than I can. But I'll say from my few jaunts into the Cameron Peak fire that serotony seems to be highly variable within that fire and that these serotonous cones are really fascinating. Um, I don't know if you can see my uh, mouse here, but um, this, they're like fossilized rocks. And once you actually really handle them, it's pretty amazing to wonder how they're actually gonna open. So Chuck is gonna dive to this, into this in more detail in his talk in just a couple minutes. So then for subalpine fir um, forested ecosystems in Colorado, these are our highest elevation ecos forested ecosystems. They are the wettest and they're incredibly important for ecosystem services, particularly around water here in Colorado. So Jason Seibel did an amazing job talking about the forest and fire ecology of sub subalpine fir forested ecosystems. So for more detail, you can visit his talk from earlier in this series. Um, but what we do know about these um, forested, these subalpine fir forests is that they have an infrequent fire return interval. And this can be anywhere from 100 to 600 or more years. And that when these forests burn, they burn very severely. Um, and the, in the past, we have dendrochronological, dendrochronological evidence that generally illustrates that these fires would regenerate relatively quickly um, and, and readily. However, um, similar to lodgepole pine um, ecosystems in Colorado recently, subalpine sub fir ecosystems have experienced um, similar compound disturbances, which include drought, followed by spruce beetle infestations in the last couple of decades. And so this is a map of the latest Colorado State Forest Service report on the health of Colorado's forests from 2020. And so the black polygons in this map indicate areas that have been impacted by spruce beetles in the last approximately 25 years. Um, and then the red polygons are the 2020 wildfire perimeters. So you can see that portions of the Cameron Peak and the East Troublesome and some of these other fires like the Middle Fork Fire and the, um, the Middle Fork Fire is here um, near Steamboat. And then the, um, the Williams Fork Fire here near Fraser. Um, that all of these fires burned in these um, areas that had had spruce beetle mortality and then wildfire. And so there's a concern that these moisture and shade loving species may have difficulty regenerating following these compound disturbances, particularly because a lot of the trees that were already within these wildfire perimeters were dead. And so we're, you know, we're lacking some seed source there. But then we're also experiencing increased temperature or drought after fire. And so there's just a lot of question about what kind of forest recovery we're gonna get in the future. And a lot of this, you know, is this concern is stemming from the fact that we don't actually have a lot of local evidence that subalpine fir regenerates easily following drought, beetle infestations, and then fire. And so we have some information, including a study that was led by um, Zoe Shapira, a CSU master's student at CSU, and other collaborators at CSU and the US Forest Service, um, where in the north central Colorado mountains, um, they found that that had experienced spruce beetle impacted. Um, um, mortality, and then wildfire, um, that in spruce beetle impacted areas, um, there was relatively consistent seedling regeneration, but areas that had experienced fire had much lower rates of regeneration in spruce and fir. Again, this is kind of indicating that there's some uncertainty around long-term forest resiliency in these, in these systems. And I think interesting to note is that 
I believe that um, you know well over half um, of these sites actually burned in the 2020 um, wildfires. Um, additionally, we have some evidence from post beetle and then um, post fire areas in the San Juan Mountains in um, so southwestern Colorado in the 2013 uh, West Fork fire complex from the study that was led by Amanda Carlson. Um, that indicates that five years post fire conifer regeneration was very low and in fact were absent from the vast majority of the burned area and in particular where surviving trees were not in close proximity. So this is kind of a similar story to what we know um, to be occurring in the ponderosa pine dominated um, post fire environments. And then Robert Andrus led a study in five fires in the San Juan Mountains of Colorado that examined tree recovery and spruce beetle impacted areas that also experienced wild, um, wildfire in five different fires and found no spruce or fir regeneration in four out of five of those fires two to eight years following fire. So again, you know, the, the, the spruce and fir recovery immediately following beetle and then um, fire is, is looking a little bit dismal. Um, and then I wanna to jump to Colorado's beloved aspen forests. You know, these can grow in, in conjunction, um, intermixed with conifers, but also as kind of pure aspen stands. And we know um, from a lot of scientific literature that aspen loves disturbance and regenerates readily following fire, avalanches, um, insect and disease disturbances, human management. Aspen really likes disturbance and so while we don't have a lot of worry that Aspen is going to regenerate following some of these wildfires, um, we've got some studies, again, this Andrus et al. Um, study that recently came out from the San Juan Mountains fires found, you know, little spruce and fir regeneration, but that Aspen regenerated quickly within three of the five fires that they studied. And, you know, one of the questions that we have is about how this will impact longer term conifer regeneration in these compound disturb disturbed areas. So that's one of our big unknowns as well. Um, and I know there's some managers here on the call, some of whom I work with, and I just wanted to kind of highlight some of the concerns that I'm hearing from them. And this is folks from all over Colorado. And, you know, I encourage um, those of you who are on the call who I work with to speak up about any of this um, in the Q&A or whenever um, in the chat. Um, but a lot of the questions that I'm hearing from managers or some of their concerns or considerations are, you know, really what the obvious question is, what can we expect in terms of natural regeneration? And, and this gets deeper, like how long do we need to wait to know if we're going to get natural forest recovery, particularly in these compound disturbed areas? And if we're going to plant, when should we start? Do we start now? Do we wait a couple of years? Do we wait 15 years? You know, there's a lot of questions around that. And I think that a lot of managers are taking really different um, perspectives on that. And then there's a lot of questions that I think are really interesting around if we're going to plant, what should we plant that might be drought or fire resilient into the future? And this is really kind of getting into some sticky, you know, questions about should we be planting the exact same species or genotypes back in these same forests or should we start experimenting with you know moving species up or or moving genotypes around um, and I, I you know these are a, this is per, for me personally um, an area that I think needs a lot of research before we do these on large scales um, and then a lot of questions around you know how strategically should we plant for the best bang for our buck. If we've got, you know, really limited resources and we have really large landscapes that we might want to reforest, how do we do that strategically to get the longest um, term forest resilience? Um, and then how will a changing climate impact this long-term recovery and reforestation efforts? Um, and I, I think that we're all kind of wondering these things. Um, and then I think a lot of managers are wondering about invasive species or resprouting species impacting this long term forest recovery. And I can say from, you know, talking with other managers, particularly in ponderosa pine dominated post fire environments that they've spent a lot of time and resources um, reforesting an area only for like 15 years after their reforestation efforts, they find that it is completely recovering to an aspen forest. And so there's just a lot of interesting questions around that. And then, you know, I think that managers are facing an enormous amount of operational, logistical, and kind of interagency considerations. And I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of this um, amongst many 
which include you know, a lack of seed sources or a lack of seeds that we have stored. Um, we have limited nursery capacity in, in a lot of cases. And then we have really interesting conundrums around things like how to transport these seedlings and then store them before we actually put them out in the ground. So some of my big takeaways, and then I'm gonna lead this over to Chuck is, you know, that in terms of long-term forest recovery, particularly in these higher elevation forests where we've experienced um, compound disturbances, we know a little bit, but we really need a lot more research to really be able to have a good understanding and to make good management decisions. And so I really think that in the next, you know, two to 10 years, we're gonna see a lot of research occur in these fires and we'll have a lot more answers coming. Um, and I'll say personally that CFRI is going to be doing immediate post-fire monitoring in three to five of the um, 2020 Colorado wildfires starting, um, you know, June of 2021. So stay tuned to some results for, from us on that. Um, and then I think another big need is a needs assessment and really focusing on knowledge gaps. And that's you know, for researchers, managers, and other stakeholders, and that's to identify those crucial areas that we just really need a lot more information. And so Chuck and I are going to be putting on a post-fire tree regeneration and forest recovery workshop um, here on April 20th. And if anyone is, you know, really excited or interested in, the, in this, please um, email me. I'll have my email address up here in a moment. Um, or, you know, feel free to um, send me a, a personal message in the chat and I, I'll be happy to send you um, registration information. And then um, CFRI and myself will be working with local management managers to coordinate some monitoring and some strategic direction and technical support for reforestation efforts into the future. So I think there's a lot more for all of us all to learn, um, but I'm going to pass it over to Chuck to talk about the really cool stuff, which is his Saratni, um, Saratni studies. So thank you so much and really appreciate it. Um, Chuck, take it away. Okay. I'm not sure if you wanna see me or not, but you don't get a choice. Okay, so thanks, Baron. That was great. And um, um, let me see here. I want to use this little red dot. Okay, cool. Um, great. This is, this is a really great workshop and uh, a seminar series, and I'm I'm glad to be part of it. And when when Nate invited me to to um, to join in, I wanted to pick one of the last possible dates because that's kind of how I roll. But also because we're doing a new study, and I wasn't sure if we would actually have anything to talk about. And I think we have something to talk about, but you guys can tell me later on when I'm done, whether you buy it or not. Um, so let's see here. I wanna to try to move my slide. Okay. So Marin set up the whole, um, some of the compound disturbance part regarding lodgepole pine and bark beetles. and. You might be asking, why does somebody who studies watershed care about trees? And I ask myself that all the time as well. Um, it's mostly because trees use water and trees stop snow from getting to the ground. And, the, and, and vegetation management is a really big part of, of watershed management. Also, when vegetation burns, it has a huge downstream effect on water quality. So that's kind of why we we get interested in it and, and, and we became very interested. And I mean, we as the Forest Service Watershed Research Group that I work in when the bark beetle came in and, and basically changed our landscape. Um, the, the, the gray phase um, situation that hap happened after that and then the fires that Marin talked about is kind of the next chapter of that. Um, and, and that's been sort of talked about is the new normal. We really don't know too much about it. And, and there's a lot of hydrologists and foresters that, are, that have been asking about it. So we've started research in that for the last couple of years. And some of the things that we've seen, they match really nicely with the stuff that Marin showed. Just to quickly um, go through a couple of the studies that, that we've had the opportunity to be involved in. The Church Park fire was one of the first fires in Grape Phase Lodgepole that burned in our neck of the woods. This is right near the Fraser Experimental Forest where I do a lot of work. And with CFRI and other collaborators, we, we were able to compare areas that had been killed by bark beetles, areas that have been salvage logged, 
area, and then areas that had been burned. And we had this nice combination of conditions. The, the, the real take home is that four years following the, uh, the, the fire, we, we found virtually no, no, um, no, no lodgepole regeneration of any kind and no subalpine fur. So that kind of matches what, what Marin was talking about from down in the uh, San Juans um, and things that have seen, been seen elsewhere. Um, we, we, uh, we've been doing a, another set of, of studies in fires that burned in 2016 and 2018, kind of along the Colorado-Wyoming border, and that includes the Beaver Creek fire, um, the Badger fire, Silver Creek, and so on. And, and what I'm showing here is, is uh, the density of new recruits. And what you can see is a whole lot of nothing, except in one case where we actually see what we're supposed to see after Lodgepole Pine is a lot of trees coming back. And so in one of these four fires, we actually saw some regeneration. And in this one, we, we saw none. In the Church Park fire, we, we assumed it had to do with the fact that it was a high severity crown fire. In these other fires, the, the problem was a lot more fundamental and it was Marin's point, it had to do with serotony. So serotony is a big deal. And, and we've known this for a long time. Um, and we've been starting to look at it. So in the fires I just showed you, this is, this is the same fires again. And we can see that last fire, that's, this is the Badger Creek fire, um, which is by Fox Park. Um, we see if you have very high levels of serotony, we have good level, we have some decent regeneration. Now, the thing that's interesting to look at is this, this comparison with about 700 stands worth of data from the greater Yellowstone area that, Monica Turner, my colleague Dan Tinker, Bill Rami, um, and others have worked on. And look at their numbers and look at their serotony levels. Dan has been scratching his head for years wondering what's going on. So they had 65% and they get 200,000. We have 65% and we get 20,000. What the hell? And then they had, e even where they had something like 10%, they were getting decent levels of regeneration, whereas we're getting virtually none until you get up to these high levels. So something's going on, it's kind of interesting. There's, we've, we've, we've tried to collect some of the serotony information off of S FS Veg. We know it's highly variable and the data that we've been able to find throughout or the areas surrounding the fires shows kind of a very mixed situation. It's, it's pretty hard to interpret. Okay, so, so, some of our, our friends at CSU did a, a, a really nice study back at the beginning of the bark beetle outbreak. We know that serotonous cones can hold um, viable seed for a really long time, um, for many decades. But what happens when those trees die and, and what happens when, when they get hit by bark beetles? So a grad student, Carissa Aoki, who's working with, with Bill Rami and Monique Rocca, studied a couple stands on the west side of Rocky Mountain National Park in the, in the years right after they got hit, so about three years after. And, and they looked at cones with age, so cones from the, the tips of the, of the branches and then farther back on the branches to get kind of an age gradient. And they found that, that sure enough, um, the, the germination rate of the, of the seeds in those cones declined with age, divine, de, de, declined by about half. But they had pretty high regeneration or germination rates. They didn't find any difference between live and dead trees in this early stage following the bark beetle. And they, they concluded that um, it didn't seem like there would be problems with um, regeneration, at least because of this seed viability question. And we know from a lot of studies that have happened in, in the years since this, that that's, that's in fact right, that there were lots of good regeneration underneath dead bark beetle stands. So there clearly were, were seeds coming out of them and, and they were viable. So that, 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 that study has been confirmed. Okay, so 2020 comes along and these trees have now been dead for 12 to 15 years later, then they burn another new study of obviously hits us in the head. So what about bugs then fire? Um, and so we went out and we, we scrambled quickly at the end of last summer, last winter, you guys might remember the, the apocalyptic fall that we all had. And we were trying to, to, to quickly get some information before um, for the managers that are addressing the questions that Marin posed, where to plant, should we plant? What are we really looking at? 
So we looked at the, we wanted to sample around all of the big fires and we grabbed a couple stands around them and in each stand we sampled 10 trees, grabbed a bunch of branches. We, we developed some sort of cone by age relationships and then did a bunch of germination trials. And that's kind of what I'd like to share with you now. So one of the, one of the cool things that we all learn probably in, a, in an undergraduate class is that when you throw serotonous cones in an oven, they pop open, it's super cool. They make a popcorn sound and everybody's happy and you feel ecologically uh, like the world is at peace. Well, that's not what happened to us. Maybe it's because I'm so cynical, but Marin mentioned the fossil cones. And what we found were that our cones were just too damn dry to open. So we had about 5% moisture in these cones. So if you know anything about the fuel moistures and the low fuel moistures that were causing the fires, you remember that it was really kind of an extreme situation. Compare the the, the, the fuel moisture in those dry cones with the fuel moisture of live cones. So they were about half. We weren't able to get the, our cones to open no matter what we did. This just shows a nice graphic of, of heating them at 60 degrees. We could have heated them, you know, we, we did heat them for weeks and got no, none of them to open. We heated them at 100 degrees. We started having them burn. We had none of them open. We used a flamethrower, we had none of them open. We had all kinds of funds with hammers and everything. We had nothing open until we started to soak them. And then all of a sudden we started to get some cones to open. Okay, so we, we, we dissected cones on branches like the Aoki study to try to get an idea of how old a cone is. And so, you know, think about it a little bit. Um, the, the youngest cones are on the tip of the tree, the, the oldest cones are closest to the bowl of the tree, all the cones die when the tree dies. And so we were, we, we would, we would cut, the, cut the branches and then do, then, then count rings for each cone. And we did that for 4,000 cone, cone calf pairs, cone branch pairs, and got, got nice relationships. We found cones that were as young as three years old at the time that they died up to 34. Um, average was about 14 or median was about 14. And we bin them up into the categories you can see here to just for, for kind of um, to simplify things a little bit. Now, remember those cones are, are not, you know, they've aged since the tree died. Okay, so, so I'm gonna present a couple data slides now. Um, and, and so I'm looking at three different things. Right here, I'm showing you seed availability. And basically the first side over here is just the number of seeds in a cone. And on the other side, it's the number of germinants in a cone. I've presented, I've got it set up by the eight different stands divided by the four different fires. Um, and, and this is sort of seeds per cone. So um, we also have time. So I've got the age of the cones. Um, across the, you know, going this way. So what you can see is kind of an average of, we had, you know, about nine to 10 um, seeds per cone on average, but the numbers varied a lot. So we had some cones that had up to 40 and, and quite a few that had none whatsoever. Now this is preliminary. And so some of these sample sizes are a little bit wonky and that's why some of these, some of these, um, means look kind of out of line. They probably are. And, and when we get additional numbers, we're hoping that things might normalize a little bit. You can see in a couple of the older ages, we just didn't have many cones. Um, but but on, general, in, on average, we found about nine seeds per cone. Okay, that's nice. But what we really care about is how many of those germinate. That's the true, those are the seeds that are gonna be available to go out into the, into the big wide world. And on average, we found about three, less than three seeds per cone that, uh, that germinated. Um, we had a, a pretty large variety and, and it varied a lot across sites. So you can see some where, you know, the average was less than two, other ones where we're up around five or six. Um, and you can see a pretty clear trend with age. So younger cones had more, older cones had fewer, except once again, where we had some of these weird, perhaps sample size numbers. Um, the other thing to note is that, uh, that lots of these cones had no germinants, had no, yeah, no germinants whatsoever. So about 40% of these older age 
uh, classes just had no seed or no code, no, no germinants in them at all. Okay, so this is kind of what you probably came for, which is the germination rates. And, and these are the numbers that compare with, uh, with Carissa's study. So again, I've set it up. You can see the eight locations, um, germinate rate, germination rate. These are, the, we ran these for about 21 days. Um, so we were, we were, you know, we ran out of germinants. Um, the first thing that you'll notice is that across the sites, there's a huge amount of variability. So it's 34% across them all, but we've got some that are way down around 20 and others that are up over 40. And even within a one fire, we see quite a bit of variability across our sites. And that's, that's pretty interesting and, and probably fairly noteworthy. We have a, overall, there's, a, there's an age decline. So older cones are, are in general, so about 40% fewer seeds in the older cones than the newer ones. Um, and, and some of these showed that trend significantly within an individual site. I'm, this is all preliminary and I'll be more comfortable when we have an additional 400 seeds to put into these relationships. But on general, we had about 34%. Okay, so let's compare that with the, the, the Aoki paper and just see kind of how we're doing compared to how they did. Um, so they, on, on average, they had about 50%, you know, they had a high of 70 down to about 30 something. The best we ever did was about 40% in our youngest cone. So we had a fairly large di dif difference, especially in those early ages. When you get down to the older ages, it's not quite such a big deal. So the the older the older uh, the older class is holding on and maybe not um, maybe not losing its viability as much. Although, as I mentioned before, there are a lot more of these cones that don't have any seed in them or no germinants at all. So that doesn't factor into that germination rate piece. Um, so that's kind of an important thing to remember. Okay, cool. So now let's do a little bit of back of the envelope stuff because we got to think a little bit about what to do with all these numbers and, and get to something that maybe somebody cares about. So, so we have an estimate of about three seeds per cone, a little bit less. And if, and if you think about, and there's, there are a number of literature values about how many cones there are per tree. This comes from lodgepole pine of trees of our size, and there's some allometry that helps to come up with a range of estimates. Um, we can look at the density of the stands that we, we've sampled and so on. And, and, and using that and scaling it up, we can come up with some nice big numbers like 1.1 or 1.6 million uh, germinants per hectare, which sounds pretty good. And um, in acres, that's you know half a million um, germinants per acre. Well, that sounds great. Okay, so if we're you know Kevin McLaughlin on the Rappo Roosevelt, and we have to think about restocking stands, we might be thinking about stuff like um, how many trees are required to be out on these areas before we start to actually think about planting. And there's a threshold the Forest Service often uses, and it's mostly for logging, and it's down very low, about 370 trees per hectare or 150 trees per acre. That's way below what silviculturalists and timber folks would really like, but it's kind of like this legal bottom end. Um, more typically, we would see 1,000 and 2,000 is not at all surprising. So these are some sort of ballpark numbers. This is an average for the Fraser Experimental Forest where we've done a lot of work in these kinds of stands. Okay, so, so that's great. We have some ballparks there. So not every seed makes it, um, unfortunately. And there's been some literature studies of looking at things like competition, herbivory, diseases, um, insect drought, and, and those, the numbers vary widely about how many seeds you need. And in a nice site with good moisture, that's, this is not Colorado, this is Oregon, um, we might only need 300 seeds per tree in, in kind of you know, high competition, droughty sites, more like Colorado conditions. We might be looking at, at, at a couple thousand to 15,000 or so seeds per tree to get something established. And the quick math on that blows these numbers up pretty, pretty significantly. And so it's pretty easy to say, hey, we're going to need something more like 3 million seeds per, per hectare, which 
might be a little bit frightening if we're thinking about numbers like this coming off of those trees. Okay, so that's the back of the envelope. And to kind of close this up a little bit, um, it's kind of a good news, bad news thing. And we've got, um, we've got some takeaways and I would love to have your thoughts on this kind of stuff. So we've definitely seen post-fire post pine regeneration um, in gray phase stands. Marin showed a, a, a seed on the first picture and, and, and we've seen places, Badger Creek fire, for example, where we get really good regeneration. Um, but it's only in stands that have pretty high serotony higher than what you might expect given historic studies in, in green stands. Um, and the, 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 the density was a tenth of what those lucky people had up in Yellowstone in the carpets that Marin was talking about. Um, we've got germination. We've got some pretty decent germination in some of these cones. So um, on average, about 34%. Um, we definitely see a decline from the study that was done in the onset of the beetle outbreak. Um, and then we've got this real sort of sticky issue of the of the of the cone moisture, which which is hard to figure out how we're going to really, you know, address that issue. And then, as I mentioned just a moment ago, we have plenty of seed out there, but it may not be enough to get back to some of the some of the um, of the of the stocking levels that we might be thinking about or what was there previously. Um, and clearly, we need to think about the prevalence of non serotonous stands all the things I'm talking about are irrelevant in non serotonin stands. Okay, so a little bit of advice, and I always like to, to, to cite some of our heroes, and here's three of them. Um, um, this is Monica Turner. Uh, Bill Rami uh, um, has been, a, is a, a legend in this work. He's a, he's a local professor, and hopefully some of you students have, have a chance to interact with Bill while you're at CSU, because he's a wealth of knowledge, and has a great career of information on the Greater Yellowstone Fire. And then my buddy, Dan Tinker up in, in Laramie, um, who, who worked with them a lot. And, and, and they have a great paper that I've cited down below here that's a great one to think about to help kind of put some of these topics in, in context. And their takeaway is, hey, it's super variable, doesn't matter, it's just very variable. They looked at about 700 stands in these post-fire environments. Um, so that's pretty, in, that's pretty daunting to think about that many stands and found st stand level regeneration from zero to 500,000. That's pretty, pretty unbelievable. Um, Post-fire serotony is really important um, and, it's, and, and, and it has a big influence on stand density as does fire size and fire regeneration. Um, um, what controls serotony is, is, is fairly hard to sort out. Um, the, at Yellowstone, they found relationships between um, stand elevation, um, and that may be something where with our high elevation forests, we may have problems with, with that piece. We're really kind of at the upper limit of lodgepole pine, so we, we might be bumping into a problem there. Their study, and, and this, this diagram here, which is a little small, um, the, this is pine regeneration, and you can see um, pine regeneration following a, following a crown fire, pine regeneration following a severe surface fire. Um, if you have a, a, a high severity crown fire, probably like what we reported at Church Park, you consume all the cones, and it doesn't matter if they're serotonous or, or not, the seeds get burned up and they're not, they're not gonna regenerate. <clears throat> Excuse me. So kind of putting all of this together, Dan, who is retired and having way too much fun operating a, a music studio to, to, to be sort of involved in this talk, but these are some of the things that I'm guessing Dan might say. You need to sta start sampling right away. You start to see regeneration in year one. It, it peaks in years two and three, so you really need to be out there and starting to sample right away. Install a lot of plots, and they 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 blew everybody away up there with 700 plots, and you're gonna need to stick with it for a number of years. Um, and there's really no easy answer. And, and, and some of these things, like was it, was it a, a crown fire or a surface fire? Those aren't things that are easily pulled off of our famous soil burn severity maps. Those are things you're gonna need to get from the ground. And so they're things that, that, that actually need to be, um, you know, 
put out on the ground. And I think um, all of us that that support field research should be um, yelling pretty loud that this work needs to be done in the field. There needs to be a lot of people out, out, out there sampling. So um, with that, we had a lot of help and I really wanna thank a lot of people, Forest Service folks who helped us get out to the field and get trees dropped and, and, and broken up, folks that were able to help us get FS veg um, information on serotony and some great um, student workers who helped us sort of really rally through this winter to be able to come up with this stuff. So hopefully the, our last set of germinations is, is underway and we'll be able to package some of this up and hopefully uh, be able to make some conclusions that will be uh, useful for managers in the next month or two. Um, uh, <laughs> low hanging fruit. So let's hope about that. And with that, thank you very much. And I will stop sharing. And stop talking. <laughs> no, no such luck, Chuck, because you have there's a ton of questions coming. So so we get to hear more of you. <laughs> that was fabulous. Um, this really complements a lot of our, our knowledge and brings us up to date on a lot of other information we're getting about these these 2020 fires. Um, so there's about seven student questions. Um, any of you who post further questions in the chat, we will be saving all the chat and we'll be sharing it with all of the speakers after the webinar. So please include your uh, email if you would like the researchers to get back with you for certain questions. Chuck, uh, if you could go ahead and post your, web, your email to chat, that would be really great. And please be sure to fill out our poll. Uh, we are self money dependent and your feedback is essential to the development of our funding and programming. Thank you very much. So um, just let us know uh, which one of you would like to take this one on. Um, can you give us some, some more basic background on serotony? Why do lodgepole pines vary in the proportion of serotonous and non-serotonous cones? Does this variation occur within a single tree or within a stand? Can you talk about why serotony involved? And just really basic, maybe give a reference because um, we have a lot of other questions. Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't really have a super tight answer. All I know is that all of the things you talked about vary. Um, cones on trees are, are often one or the other, but they can be mixed within a tree. They're often mixed within stands. Um, so one of the, one of the uh, um, sort of general understandings is that um, at high elevation, fire frequency decreases and, and serotony is sort of re relates to fire frequency. So that's one of the, the fairly well understood pieces or, or and, and, and I think that that's a, another Yellowstone um, finding. Um, Tanya uh, Shonagol and folks at CU studied that. Uh, she was a student of Monica. So, um, and there are, uh, there's a lot of other things going on with site variability that influence it. So I think that th there's more to be looked at. Yep, um, Marin or Chuck, if you, uh, while we're answering some other questions, if you have a reference or um, somebody else, if you have a, I'm, I'm, my hands are busy right now, but if somebody can uh, post a reference, a general reference to serotony in the chat, that would be really great. Um, <clears throat> for serotonous lodgepole stands, is there any difference in susceptibility to desiccation between seeds released from cones via fire or those released over longer periods of times? For example, radiant heat in the canopy or heat from the ground uh, in beetle affected trees. So you've got a beetle affected trees, heat might make the um, cone in the air or on the ground open versus the cone on, from the fire. I'll take, a, I'll take a, a whiff at that one. I think Rob Hubbard's on this call. He should probably answer this question. But, um, you know, the, the non-serotonous cones, I, I would suspect because they don't, they, they open up and, and they're, you know, they release their, 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 their seeds a lot earlier, I suspect that they would stay at a moisture content that's much higher than these cones that sort of, you know, go through this death decay fossilization thing that we were talking about. So, um, you know, the way serotony works, 
there are, there are resins that kind of glue the scales together and it's the heat that 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 sort of melts those resins and allows them to open but once they get super super dense like a rock resin or not they just don't they they it's almost like the scales don't really have the give anymore so rob i don't know if you want to say something um, or anybody else cuz that's not really something i know much about we got about eight more minutes. Uh, Rob, I'll give you 30 seconds if you want to unmute and put your video on and um, add any of that. Yeah, no, I, um, I I think Chuck answered that answered that great. Whoops, sorry, my video is not turning on. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> um, but can you hear me anyway? Yeah, yeah, we all can hear you. Thank yeah, you. okay. Um, you know, when we did a lot of work up at, uh, up at Fraser, following the initial... Um, beetle attack and then salvage logging, we saw lots and lots of cones opening from just heat on the ground and lots of good regeneration. And I think, you know, based on what we've been finding with this current study, it's clear that, you know, things are degrading as time goes on. And the, the whole bit about the cones not opening because they were so dry and fossilized, you know, at first really, really surprised us. But, um, I think for sure, as time goes on, seed viability is going to be going down. And um, so early on, they were more viable and are definitely getting less so now. Great. Thanks so much, Ron, for hopping on on that. And just uh, two seconds worth of interesting trivia. Um, Dr. Peter Brown of Rocky Mountain Tree Research shared once at a conference that lodgepole on the Oregon coast, there's coastal lodgepole and they don't use serotony at all. They don't need it, <laughs> but they're still lodgepole. So that's how much variety you could find within a, a species. Um, could beetle kill trees? Oh, this is the perennial question. Could beetle kill trees burn more intensely than live trees to the point where serotonous cones are damaged beyond viability? So we're back to the beetle kill question, um, cause, cause more effects. So um, we we know well we we know that um, flammability increases as um, as the beetles hit trees. Um, there have been a number of studies that have shown that um, whether the 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 fire intensity is different within a a beetle kill versus a green tree, I would sort of doubt it, just because these are really wind driven events. And it's the it's the wind and the sort of the flamethrowerness of the of that high of those high dry conditions. I mean, they're 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 wind driven typically during drought. So I, I'm not I'm not sure about that. And and I, I think there are probably more talented people. I would probably ask Chad Hoffman that question and see what he he would say. Rob might know as well because he's done studies on the flammability, but I, I'm I'm not sure that it would would matter. Marin, you might know. I I don't know anybody else could jump in on that one. Uh, so the needles on the needles on brown. I mean, you know, it's no surprise. I mean, everybody was really worried about the increased flammability as you started getting all these dead needles on trees right after um, right after the beetle attack. But the thing is, is that those needles don't stick around very long, and so you end up with um, they, they definitely are more flammable than a live needle. And Matt Jolly up in Montana, we did a paper with him looking at fuel moisture and um, ignitability. But the thing is, is that those, um, you know, those needles fall off fairly quickly. And so you don't have the canopy biomass that you have in a gray phase. And so that's going to you know, in all things being equal, that would kind of just lower the amount of fuel that's going to be burning and you would expect would be, you know, not quite so intense, but um, there's, there's a bunch of factors with that. So I, you know, to try to get at that in respect, with respect to whether or not it would damage serotonous cones, I think we, we have a ways to go before we could, we could get to that answer. Oh, thank you very much, Ron. Um, I'm going to hop ahead real quick. Um, Marin, I think this is, might be best for you, but uh, other people can contribute. How does the presence of bark beetle outbreaks affect the time scale 
of conifer regeneration following forest fires? I mean, I think that, you know, there's not a lot of information about that yet. So that's my personal, but I think Chuck's study is starting to get into this a little bit in terms of, you know, the age from mortality that is, that is showing up to be really important. So I, um, I think, you know, all of these are excellent questions and are illustrating the amount of knowledge gaps that we really have about forest recovery in these compound disturbances, um, particularly now that we're facing climate change. So it's a yeah, great I think question. That, I think the new normal is that we can't really, we, we can't really base what we're seeing on, on past information very well. It's gonna be a lot harder. Um, and and climate and these compound disturbances are the main main reason. There's just a lot of uncertainty. So on uh, back to the uh, lodgepole um, seed viability, can the soil itself retain an adequate seed bank for lodgepole pine regeneration? If you have a soil seed bank, is it is it effective and as viable as a serotonous cone seed bank? Yeah, that's a great question, and that's that's the uh, hundred thousand dollar question. And so we've got some things going on right now where we've taken the we've taken our cones, our little fossils, and we bury them in the forest floor, and 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 we simulate what what spring snowmelt looks like. So we wet that up, and we see what this what the cone moisture looks like. And sure enough, they wet up, and they and they and they 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 will open. <laughs> So, so that's, that soil seed bank is really important and, and maybe the way that some of this will go. Um, and I think that that's a really important piece. And I think that we should, I mean, that's definitely where, where we're gonna be studying. I think that's a, that's a key point. It's, I don't know that much about this. I mean, I'm a soil scientist. So I, 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 I think, um, you know, you got seeds falling out of a tree versus seeds coming up out of a soil seed bank, you're gonna get a really different sort of density of regeneration. And, and I think you want those cones in the, in the canopy if, if you can get them. Great. Um, the next question, uh, I'm putting in a shameless plug for uh, an upcoming Southern Rockies um, event that will be addressing this question question. Uh, we've just got a few more minutes, so I'm going to try to go through this real quick. Um, does post-beetle salvage logging in montane and subalpine Rocky Mountain forests accomplish any ecological objectives? Or are they solely, util solely utilized for economic and safety goals? Um, 30 seconds to take a stab at that. We will have a uh, salvage science summit coming up with uh, four speakers. Uh, it's asynchronous, so you can view the video, uh, the video recordings on your own, and then we'll have a panel discussion with the Southern Rockies and Fire Science Network group in May. I, I'm not sure I really caught all of that. So the idea that that is was the question: Does salvage logging have any have any potential in ecological benefit? Yes. Or is yes. it all? Uh, yes, it does. Safety. Done well in the right place at the right time. It certainly does. That's how you you can regenerate forests that way. And we've got lots of research in bark beetle work in Colorado that shows exactly that. Done poorly, it doesn't. So, you know, there's the good and the bad. But, but in, uh, most salvage logging on Forest Service land in Colorado has been done with, with really strict guidelines about, um, about watershed protection and, and it's managed really carefully and the results are, are outstanding. Um, we have another, thank you, Chuck. We have one more question and we're at all, just about time. The students will need to leave and go to a student meeting. Uh, we can do a couple more questions if Chuck and Marin have time. Um, thank you to Cindy and Ty and Nathan and Jack uh, Douglas, uh, Southern Rockies Fire Science Network student is, uh, assistant is buried here in the attendees. Um, he has kept up with all the continuing education work and a lot of the statistics and logistics for this. And this is his last webinar and he'll be moving on um, to the Western Slope. So thank you very much, Jack. Um, the next question is how do different aspects, elevation, latitude or weather 
affect recovery, but I'm thinking that a lot of your your uh, presentations have covered that. Is there anything else that we I missed about that? Take a look at their presentations. <laughs> uh, here's a Dan Nolan asks, assuming that the old cones originally had more seeds when they were young, what happened to them that results in fewer by the time they're old? If the I don't know. That's a great question, and I I don't I don't know the answer to that. And we're we're scratching our heads right now. You know, one of the ideas is that the good cones opened up, and all you have left are the old crappy ones still on the tree, and that may be part of it. That there may actually be a bit of a bias that you know, like the idea that these were aborted, that weren't fully formed, or something like that. So. We don't know. I'm not really sure how we're going to address that, but that's a good question, and we're we're not certain about that. But thanks. Uh, for that could one. Be, if they could last so long, there could be a lot of things in the tree's history that could affect it. Yeah, that I that's that's true, Gloria. I mean, we we looked at it. You you know, they're closed up, so you'd think you'd if they rotted on the inside, you'd know that, and so that doesn't seem like that explains it. Um. Uh, Thomas Timberlake, hi Thomas, is uh, curious to see what these landscapes will be like 20 years from now. Are these results pointing to lots of burned areas looking conifer-less, like, like Hayman, or is the expectation that we'll see some pretty novel looking lodgepole stands that are less dense uh, than the contemporary lodgepole, but still have conifer on them? That's a great Marin question. Yeah, um, thank you, Thomas, for a great question. I personally, I feel a little reluctant to say that I can make a guess because I think that we don't have enough information yet, um, which is again, where I really feel the need to see more research about this. I, I think if I, ha if I was forced to make a guess, I think we're gonna see a lot of variability. I think we are gonna see some coniferless, you know, Hayman-like burn scars. And I think we're also gonna see you know, what we would expect out of um, lodgepole, but I think it's gonna be highly variable within and amongst these fires. And, you know, I think a lot of it really depends on what kind of drought conditions we may or may not have um, over the next couple of years when, when we really know that, the you know, a lot of conifer regeneration really occurs in the first five to 10 years following fire. So um, I, I think this is the million dollar question. Yeah, and I think I, I think you know a piece from that yellow from the Yellowstone work, it was highly variable even there, and now it's going to be highly variable, but for different reasons. They found lots and lots of areas that had sort of lower levels of regeneration, and few that had that sort of, you know, dog hair several hundred thousand per hectare types of density. So, but I yeah I. I have a feeling we'll be seeing some some new things out there, but it's hard to know what they'll be. Yeah, and the interesting there's some re interesting research which I still need to post to our Southern Rockies Network um, website about fascinating dendrochronology research that was done in the Northern Rockies by dendrochronologists up there that showed that there's there was such a different distribution of lodgepole and some fire resistance that resulted in much different distribution up there. So that's that's something that would be a research to look at as well. Um, Dan Dallas, if our speakers are okay hanging on, and we still have 64 people. <laughs> uh, there's an operating, Dan Dallas points out, there's an operating assumption that all passing flame fronts are the same. This is a very good point. They are not. Many times we see extreme fire beh behavior events uh, in two flame fronts on the same acre. A fast moving canopy fire, whether needles or small twigs after needles are gone, that throws advanced spots, then a slow moving backing fire on the ground, generally severe fire effects. So how the fire behavior is passing through either canopy or backing fire or following the flame front could greatly affect um, lodgepole, serotony and survival, I suppose. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. And I, I think it's gonna be, uh, um, it, it's going to be important to be looking for that sort of behavior when we're when we're looking at um, regeneration plots and trying to s sort of split up just even simply if it was mostly a crown fire or a surface fire. And we know with Cameron Peak at least, and well, all of these fires, 
there were big days and there were not big days. And, and I don't know whether there are situations like you've mentioned there, Dan, I'm, sh I'm sure there were, where there was, you know, a big day and then, a, then some sort of a, of, a, of a surface fire. But I know from the bear teams that, you know, some areas where there were those big crown runs, they didn't really see that much going on on the ground. So it might have just been, you know, crown consumption, cone consumption, and not, you know, not the other piece. So I think there'll be, it'll be really interesting to look at that this summer. And I, I guess I just want to throw this out here. This probably goes without saying, but, you know, a lot of these fires finished burning right before snow started to fly and the, the, the forests were closed. And so we really, you know, a lot of researchers have not even really been able to get out into these fires, um, you know, to kind of really take a look at what's going on. So I think that we just have an incredible amount of unknown still, um, just even in terms of we haven't even been able to walk these landscapes and really kind of ponder this, um, all these issues yet, so. Yeah, a lot of variability out there we don't even know about yet. There's another salvage logging question. Um, sign up for Southern Rockies Fire Science newsletters, either the Southern Rockies or Northern Rockies and participate in our Salvage Science Summit that's coming up uh, later this month and in May. Um, since we're collecting older dead cones for planting purposes, are we perpetuating poor genetics? This is really Chuck's comments on older cones and maybe ones that were have aborted tissues are not good. Old dead cones on live trees. We're running around getting old dead cones on live trees and using them for planting. Bad genetics. What, what's, what, what's an old dead cone on a live tree? If it's on a live tree, wouldn't it be live? I'm not sure what that means. I mean, serotonous cones aren't, are, I mean, technically, like my fingernails are alive and they're on me and, they're, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure how that works, but I, I would, I could see how you might perpetuate bad genetics in lots of ways, but I'm not sure, um, I might, I'm probably missing the question. This is clearly over my pay grade. <laughs> maybe he uh, maybe he also means um, old dead cones on the ground as well. Uh, let me see. Dan Dallas tracking quiescent days associated with growth mapping is a ripe area for looking into how fire effects interact with what you are all interested in. He noticed this when trying to replant on the West Fork fire, uh, which is very interesting. Um, so very cool. We are uh, well over time, we're 10 minutes over time. And um, this will be, uh, this has been recorded and will be posted to the Southern Rockies Fire Science uh, YouTube channel. And thank you very much for participating in our poll. Ty, you wanna do our outro? Thank you very much to our speakers, fabulous presentations. I really like that last question, thanks. I think that's a great, I, great one. And it's really important for soil burn severity stuff as well. They're those, sort of comparing big days versus versus not big days. It's a big difference for the way the fire is affecting soils. So thank you. Great, I'm going to just show this real quick. No, I'm not. I'm just gonna end this recording now. <laughs>